I'm Quincy Newell, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. We're concluding our conversation with Dr. Quincy Newell. We're going to talk about a very sensitive topic within the LDS Church. Is our theology racist? Dr. Quincy Newell is a non-LDS historian. She's never been Mormon. And so it's going to be interesting to see her reaction to that question. It's going to be a very important conversation, and I hope you check it out. Also, at the end of the video, we're going to give away this copy of her book, Your Sister in the Gospel, that talks about the life of Jane Manning James. So stay tuned for that to see if you're a winner. Now back to our conversation. Um, so I do want to ask this question because I'm curious, and I don't, we'll, we'll see how good a, <laughs> what, what information is there. Sure. Because I know with Mark Staker, uh, he was one of my first people I interviewed, and he said it was pretty common um, to ordain men as soon as they were baptized. He believes there was a black man named Black Pete in 1830 that was baptized. Um, and, you know, it typically it would seem common, uh, you know, I believe Walker Lewis was, baptized, was ordained soon after his baptism. I believe that was the case with Elijah Abel. Um, although, you know, I, it's not like we have priesthood certificates, so it's a little bit hard to tell. Um, but as far as Isaac James in Nauvoo, it, it, would, it would seem to me that that would be unusual that he wouldn't have had the priesthood. Um, do, do you have any sense for why that might have been? Or, or was it just kind of a, hey, we like you, we'll give you the priesthood, we don't like you, or, you know, we'll, like, we'll baptize you. I mean, do you have any sense for how, uh, especially black, m black Mormon men were ordained in that early time period? We, let's see, so the research that we have, we only have a handful of black men who, who we can say pretty definitively were ordained um, during Joseph Smith's lifetime. Um, so in in that sense, no, I don't. I don't have a good reason um, to to explain why some black men were ordained and some weren't. Um, it may have had a lot to do with individual missionaries who were deciding whom to to give the priesthood to and whom not to. Um, but it, it, I think you're right. It was not uncommon for men of any race, um, to receive baptism and then receive the priesthood shortly thereafter. Um, it seems to have been a pretty chop-chop procedure. Um, some research is starting to show, I think, that it was, it was far more common than we have initially believed for there to be a longer gap between baptism and ordination. Oh, really? Um, so that may have had a little bit to do with it as well. Um, but... Yeah, I really don't have uh, a good explanation for why there would be such a stark racial difference so early on. Yeah, I'm just curious about that because it seems like, and I'll, I will specify, in the 1830s, it seems like it was pretty common to just baptize and ordain. Not that there were a lot of black people being baptized anyway, but, um, and then I, I wonder, because you, you had mentioned um, that Isaac James came with, uh, was it Charles Ivins? Charlie, yeah, the Ivans family. So and Charles and Anthony. Were, were, yeah. Was he? Do we have any idea if he was baptized in New Jersey or or Nauvoo? I don't know offhand. Yeah, that would be um, interesting to yeah. see to find out. Because I know there were some more things going to Nauvoo, and you know Joseph was running for president, and so kind of tiptoed around that issue a little bit more than he had earlier in the 1830s. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of interesting. Well, let's let's go ahead and finish this up again. Then, with uh, tell tell us about the end of, of Jane's life. <laughs> Is there anything in particular that you'd like to know? <laughs> well, it, it does seem like we, we've kind of covered this idea. Well, I do want to ask you this because I believe um, one of the petitions that came to Jane for the temple was. The death of, I want to say Elijah Abel in the, in the 1870s. I, I can't remember exactly what year he was born. I, and I know she, she, she had made these petitions to the temple. Did that pretty much continue through her death? 
Yes. These, these yeah. petitions. Yeah. Do you, do you have any idea? Cause it sounds like she's done two or three of them at least, or, or more than that. So my guess is that there are more out there than we know about. Um, but they, what we have that's written down starts in the 1880s and continues pretty much for the rest of her life. Um, the last documented one might be 1902 or 1905, something like that. Um, she gets permission at least three different times to go to temples and do baptisms for her dead. Um, and so she does baptisms for her dead in 1875 in the endowment house. Um, and then in the 1880s and 1890s in the Logan and Salt Lake temples. Um, but other than that, she, she keeps on asking to receive her endowments, to be sealed to Joseph Smith as a child, to have her family members sealed to Joseph Smith as a child, to be sealed in marriage to Walker Lewis or to her husband, who she doesn't name, so it's not entirely clear who she means. Um, but uh, all of those requests just keep getting denied. Um, and so it, we talked about earlier um, the sealing as a servant to Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. That's as much as she gets during her lifetime. So when she dies, her understanding is that she will um, be a servant to the Smith family for eternity. Um, and that's, that's something to sit with, right? I mean, that's, that's a piece of really interesting, amazing religious creativity on the part of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles to create a whole new ceremony, to create a new category in heaven um, that the, this person can occupy. Um, and it's a stunning example of racism in theology, um, that, that there would be a whole new ceremony created to support a racist system, um, and that it, it just sits there for 70 years, mm -hmm. um, more than 70 years. Um, so that's, the, I think, in many ways, the great tragedy of Jane's life, that she keeps asking for this thing um, that she believes is absolutely vital to her salvation and to the salvation of her family. And the white men in charge say no because she's black. Um, she, when the 1978 revelation comes down, she is uh, eventually sealed to Joseph Smith as a child, as she requested, and she's sealed to her family. Um, but I think it's really easy to go straight, straight to that um, and, and to skip the sitting with that 1894 ceremony that seals her as a servant. Um, and so, so I tend to, to try and emphasize the tragic aspects of Jane's life. Yeah. Um, All right, so when did she die again? She died in April of 1908. Okay. And I, I believe, I know with Elijah Abel, with his death, there was a, a big write-up in the, or maybe not a big one, but a, a definite obituary. And it seems like, if I remember right, Jane was kind of celebrated a little bit at her death. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, she was well respected in the community, um, in part because of her relationship to Joseph Smith. She was one of the last people alive who had known him in person. Um, and so that she was sought out for her memories of the prophet. Um, and Joseph F. Smith spoke at her funeral. Um, she, was, she was celebrated and lauded as an upstanding member of the community, um, well-respected and to be missed. Um, but, at, I mean, at the same time, one account of the funeral said that Joseph, Joseph F. Smith talked about how she would be, um, she would receive all of her wishes in heaven and that she would have a, a white and glorified body. Um, and that's not an exact quote, but he did say she would be white. Um, and it, that is, I mean, there's a really interesting aspect to, to imagining that scene, right? I mean, if you think about Joseph F. F. Smith standing in front of a congregation that includes a lot of black faces um, and talking about how Jane, this respected black woman in the community, is going to be white in heaven, 
then that's all kinds of problematic. Well, and I know a lot of people are going to have a hard time with that because they're like, well, that's not racist. Uh, but even as No, late, but that's racist. Oh, I know it is. <laughs> Um, I, I know I'm going to get comments on that, but anyway, the other because even as late as 1978, um, I remember President Kimball, who we all laud for this wonderful thing, talked about Indians who would become a white and delightsome people, mm -hmm. and I, I know, I know he said that with the best of intentions, and it's hard, I think, especially for really orthodox people to say that's a racist statement. But it's a racist statement, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's it's hard because I know a lot of black people, Indians, you know, whatever nationality, have had to deal with this. Uh, I hate to call it white supremacy, but that's it's what white it supremacy. Is. Yeah. yeah, it is. And so, uh, what can we say to people to to get them to understand that 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 really is racist theology? <laughs> Not being an LDS theologian, um, that is a, a challenging question for me to answer. I, um, so I think there are Mormon theologians who are far more able to address this question than I. But I guess I would start with the idea that... Um, the Bible says we are all made in God's image. Um, I was uh, raised as a Protestant, and so I think of God as beyond gender, beyond race, like not having either one of those characteristics. I know for Mormons that's different, um, but I think that you have to start with the question of, well, why is the default image of God an old white guy? Right? Do you want me to give you the Mormon response? Well, no, I mean, I know God has a body and so on, but um, but I don't think Scripture tells us what color that body was. And so, so if we start by thinking about what does Scripture actually tell us, and and then think about, and what are we adding? What kinds of cultural assumptions are we adding to the baseline that we get from Scripture? That's where we can start to tease apart where does racism enter in. Um, that's maybe one starting place. All right, well, do you have any last thoughts before I let you go? I don't think so. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Well, I, I meant to bring your book. I was going to get it autographed. I guess I'll have to do that uh, at MHA this weekend. So. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, Quincy Newell, thank you for so much for, for being here on Gospel Tangents. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Quincy Newell, and I'd really like to encourage you to go out and buy her book, Your Sister in the Gospel. It's a fantastic book. And so now is the great time where I and my son Preston, go ahead and come on over Preston, are going to give away this copy of this book. So, Preston, can you go ahead and shake it up really good? Okay. <laughs> All right, now go ahead and pull out a name and we're going to find out who the winner is here. He's got his eyes closed. What do you got? What does it say here? Tom Williams. So, Tom, you are the winner of your sister in the gospel. So please send me an email at gospeltangents at gmail.com and then tell me where you want me to send the book. So congratulations, Tom, and thanks for subscribing to my newsletter and listening. In our next conversation, I'm excited to introduce David Osler. He's written this fantastic book called Bridges. And we're going to learn more about this and why he decided to write this book in the first place. You know, when I started studying uh, faith crisis, disaffiliation, my own background, it's in evidence-based medicine. So, you know, it's like, what does the data say is the first question we ask. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, so I spent time trying to understand um, what we knew about the problem, what people had written, what studies had been done, what data had been collected. And, and um, like most problems, um, we all have impressions about a particular area, 
but when we go in and study it systematically, mm -hmm. sometimes we find those impressions are, are not entirely accurate. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview and you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button of course we're also on Facebook Twitter and all the other places uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents and don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.